Welcome back to Sports Class with Dr. K. Stay tuned in future episodes. We're going to be doing episodes covering the biggest turnarounds in NBA history and some of the biggest letdowns in postseason history. So if you're interested in those topics, subscribe to the channel to get updates on those and other new episodes. In this episode, I'm going to introduce a new kind of lesson called Sports Movies You Might Have Missed. Now, eventually we're going to get to some more obscure sports movies over time where I understand why you might have missed it. But I need to cover a few movies that it'd be kind of hard to miss these as you went along. But I understand viewers of a younger generation may not have caught some of the all-time classics. So we're going to talk about some of those first. And in this first episode, I'm going to cover an obscure little Sly Stallone vehicle called Rocky IV. Rocky IV. Now, if you missed that movie, what's wrong with you? Where have you been? This is one of the all-time classic sports films. At the same time, I get it. This movie is now almost 35 years old. Sly Stallone is not the megastar that he once was, and those films of the 80s are, have been missed by viewers of a younger generation. So, if by some chance you haven't caught this classic sports film, I'm going to tell you about it in this episode. I'm going to go over some of the basic facts about the film, then I'm going to give you five big things, five important things to remember about this movie, Rocky IV. So let's get started. Okay, before we get to the five big things about this film, Rocky IV, let me give you a little bit of background into the film. It was, of course, the fourth film in the Rocky series, the first of which came out in 1976 to little fanfare. The first Rocky film was produced on a million dollar budget, a small film, by an unknown writer and actor named Sylvester Stallone. The film was a surprise hit in the bicentennial year of the country. It captured many of the emotions of the nation as Rocky Balboa, this down on his luck tomato can boxer from Philadelphia, was given his chance at the title by the champion Apollo Creed. Now, of course, Rocky didn't win that first fight, but just by going the distance against the great fighter, Creed, he achieved a victory in himself, and the nation was captivated by this story. In 1979, the sequel came out, Rocky II. And in this one, Rocky does win the championship, defeating his nemesis, Apollo Creed. In 1982, the third Rocky film came out. Now, for those who have seen this series, this is a favorite as Rocky fought the vicious fighter Clubber Lang, who was played by Mr. T. This was a riveting film and had some of the best training and action sequences in all of the Rocky films. Of course, Rocky eventually prevails against the vicious Clubber Lang uh, to retain the title in that film. Now, those three films set the stage for our movie today, Rocky IV which came out in 1985. So for viewers of that generation, there were several years of anticipation and expectation. What would the next Rocky film involve? And of course, this film, Rocky IV, involved some of the Cold War tensions that circulated around the country and the world at that time. By 1985, Sylvester Stallone was a mega star. Rocky was a solid franchise as a film, and the world was caught in these Cold War tensions. I'll give you a quick synopsis of the storyline, and then we'll get to those five big points. So, by this film, Rocky Balboa has been the champion, and he's comfortable, he's wealthy, but he's also getting a little bit soft, at least in the minds of some. So early in the film, we get some shots of the Russian champion, Ivan Drago, just demolishing his opponents and calling out that he wants to fight the American champion, Rocky Balboa. Instead, it's the former champ, Apollo Creed, who steps up to accept the Russian's challenge. And there's a lot of kind of cheesy scenes early in the film as Creed stages this exhibition match against the Russian champ. But what happens in that exhibition turns the mood of the entire film from the early kind of frivolous happy moments to a very serious film after Apollo Creed is actually killed in the ring by the Russian fighter. And so of course Rocky needs to step up to avenge his fallen friend Apollo Creed and we have the famous sequences leading up to the final fight. 
uh, including some of the greatest training sequences in any of the Rocky films. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in the five big points. For those who haven't seen this film, if in fact you have missed it, I won't give away the end, although it's not exactly a shocking ending. So, let's get to those five big points about this film. All right, point number one, Russia is bad. This film lays it on so thick throughout the whole movie, everything depicted about Russia is terrible. Particularly, of course, the villain, Ivan Drago the boxer. He is cruel, he's ruthless, he's merciless in the ring. But his wife is also icy and pitiless. His manager and his coach and everyone around him, they're all mean-spirited jerks. But beyond that, the way the film is made depict Drago always in kind of evil and malicious viewpoints. Uh, the film around him, it's always dark. There's mist and smoke. The music when Drago is on screen is ominous and fierce. And so we get the sense that everything about Russia is bad. And of course, that captured the mood in the country at that time, in which most Americans viewed the Soviets with fear and with suspicion and concern in the late stages of the Cold War. All right, point number two, the USA is good. In contrast to the Russians, which are always viewed in a negative light, everything about the Americans is appealing in this film, particularly in the early scenes when the American characters, which are principally Rocky and his family and his faithful sidekick, Polly, they're always doing fun things. They're partying, they're dancing, they're laughing, they're joking, they're laid back, they're relaxed. Everything about the American characters is positive. Now, of course, this goes over the top into the realm of cheesiness, particularly in the scene where we see James Brown singing Living in America and everything is red, white, and blue. It's over the top, but it lays on very thick that everything about the United States is good and everything about the Soviet Union in this era is bad. Let me mention the all-important training sequences, which emphasize both points one and points two. When we see Drago training, he's very mechanical. He's almost half man, half machine. Everything is done in very mechanized fashion. And in a brief but very important moment, he is seen taking an injection at one point, which of course suggests the nefarious Soviet cheaters who will do anything to win. Rocky, of course, is shown in complete contrast to that. His training sequences couldn't be more natural and wholesome. He's literally running up mountains, running through the snow, chopping wood, throwing boulders around. Everything Rocky does is good and wholesome and natural. Everything the Soviet does is mechanized and overseen and cheating at the bottom line. Okay, point number three. The Cold War is everywhere in this film. This kind of brings together points number one and two. Russia bad, USA good. So President Ronald Reagan, by the mid-1980s, had restoked the fears and concerns of the early Cold War. And by 1985, both sides really lived in an atmosphere of fear and suspicion of the other side. Movies like Rocky IV fulfilled this vision in the realm of popular culture. There were a lot of songs and a lot of films made in this era that really kind of brought those Cold War fears to light. This puts Rocky IV in a genre that one group of historians has very cleverly and I think correctly dubbed popcorn patriotism. A number of films from the early through the mid-1980s, films like the Rocky series, the Rambo series, a number of Arnold Schwarzenegger films, Chuck Norris films, show Americans fighting the Cold War on the big screen. Popcorn patriotism, what a great way to describe this genre. So let's get to a, a sub point here, point 3A, which is not all Russians are bad, contradicting what I said earlier. The final sequences of this film really raise some questions about this thought that all Russians are bad. We see the Russian crowd in the final sequences actually cheering for Rocky. And of course, Rocky's final famous words in the film, if I can change and you can change, everybody can change, strikes a hopeful note. 
at the end of this kind of Cold War battle. We need to keep in mind, we're really just a few years away from the end of the Cold War. By 1985, the first cracks were starting to creep in. We're a couple of years off from Glasnost and Perestroika, the opening of the Soviet Union. And by 1989, the Berlin Wall comes down, the Cold War comes to an end. So while we're still in the middle of it in 1985, we see that hopeful note creeping in right at the end of the film. And that kind of note was permeating popular culture as well. All right, point number four, women are an afterthought. Now, sports films leading up to this era, uh, really before a league of their own, rarely depicted women in any kind of meaningful way. They typically were wives or cheerleaders or kind of confused onlookers. And that was certainly true of this Rocky film. The most powerful of all of them, of course, is Drago's wife, Ludmilla. But she's depicted in such stereotypical, mechanical terms that it's almost humorous. She's barking at officials. She's barking at her husband and bossing him around. So this is not really a positive depiction of a woman, even though she's very strong. The other women in the film are much meeker. Rocky Balboa's wife uh, goes through her typical transformation, first opposed to him fighting and then eventually coming around to supporting him. But her character is really not developed in this film. And Apollo Creed's wife is the meekest of them all, shown in only a couple of scenes and most memorably crying and just watching as her husband is beaten to death in the ring. Quick side note, actress Bridget Nilsson, who played Ludmilla, actually married Sylvester Stallone shortly after filming this movie. Of course, that marriage ultimately fell apart. She went on to hook up with other people down the road like Flava Flav, but the two connected in more ways than one filming this movie. All right, point number five, the last one, this film is not as bad as the critics say. Check it out for yourself if you haven't seen it. This film gets a 40% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is pretty bad. And the comments there are generally correct. This film lays it on way too thick with flashbacks and with cheesy 1980s guitar music, but you gotta put it in its context. It really does stand as a testament to that time period, the mid 1980s. And while the dialogue is kind of wooden and staged, I think it represents reasonably well the way the sides viewed each other in 1985. There is this kind of dual note of suspicion and fear on both sides, and yet the Russian people, by the end of the film, are shown in sympathetic terms. And I think at the end of the day, a lot of people agreed with that perspective. Our problems in that era were not with the Russian people or with the American people, was with the leaders and the governments on both sides. So there you have it. Five big things about this film that, who are we kidding? You didn't miss that film. Nobody missed that film, Rocky IV. Everybody's seen it. But check it out again. Remind yourself that it's really not as bad as people say. Tell me in the comments below what you think about this film or if there are other films you want to hear about in these reviews, movies you might have missed. Like, comment, and subscribe and we'll see you next time.